Now, let's, let's just start by turning back to Matthew chapter 4. Because whenever I want to know about anything, I always first check the person I respect the most, their opinion and, and what they uh, believe and everything. I always check with them first. If they have commented on it, then that's what I want to believe, okay? So if you want to know how to lay hold on eternal life, and if you want to know how to have vitality in your eternal life, then you ought to look to the person you most deeply respect in the realm of eternal life. And that would, I hope, be the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And we're just going to quickly look at Jesus describing the tension between a life dominated by the temporal and a life dominated by the eternal. And in the Gospels, Jesus spends hours addressing this. Hours. In fact, Jesus told 39 stories. 39 stories. Yeah, and now I understand why I tell stories. We were just in the East Coast, and um, I probably already told you this. I'm getting so old I forget what I tell who. But we were in the East Coast last month, and I was speaking at this little church. And what's so amazing now with the Internet and the downloads of the MP3s, these people are listening to everything. I mean, because most people sit at their computers, and I guess most people don't work at work anymore, and they just listen to the computer, I guess. I don't know how they do it, but it's so interesting. I walked in to speak at the church, and during their greeting time, I had about four or five people come up to my chair, and they say, what is it that he does? They were talking to me as if I knew what they were talking about, and I smiled at them. I always smile at people so I don't act like they're dumb, you know. And uh, I smiled at him, and I said, what do you mean? And they said, what is it that he does? I said, who? They said, the music guy at your church, the one that plays the trumpet. I said, oh, Don, what do you mean? They said, because in your sermons you always say, Don, it's so cute how you did this. You know how he flips his trumpet, and I say it's like he puts it in his holster. But you see me, I go like this. And they couldn't see my hands over the computer on the mp3 audio file and i said oh don spins his trumpet like it's a gun and then i i think he puts it in his holster (laughs) do you know what that taught me people catch the stories jesus told 39 stories half of them as we'll see are about money half jesus talked more about money than he did prayer discipleship in general heaven and hell Put together. Talk more about money. Jesus met them right where they were. And he said, like the story that I read to you during the, the elder prayer time, was about money. 39 parables, half of them are about money. Let, let's just spend a little time with Jesus on this this morning, and we'll pick up here next week. Matthew 4, 4. In the middle of the temptation, he answered and said, It is written, man should not live by bread alone, the temporal life, eating, working, having a house, taking care of your family, paying the bills, looking to the future, providing for the needs, making sure that your children have what they need and your wife is cared for and your life is not falling apart. Man shall not live by bread alone. That's our temporal, ongoing life. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need the temporal life. I mean, we are not on a cloud with a harp yet. Or I don't think we ever will be. But you know what I mean. We're not in heaven yet. But... This is not all there is. And we spend our life's energy as if this is all there is. We, we, we focus as if this is all there is. That's coming, but this is all there is. And, and we're just fixated on the temporal and our health and our savings. And, our, you know. and we can really get upset if things are going wrong. I mean, people's lives fall apart. They lose whatever. Jesus said, don't live by, by just the temporal but by the eternal, every word of God. Now look at chapter 6. Jesus, chapter 6 of Matthew's gospel, verse 19. Jesus is giving the greatest sermon he ever gave. By the way, uh, Matthew, if you know Matthew, Matthew, the tax collector, do you remember how a tax collector was? They had books with columns, and they categorized people, you know, and, and they would put them in columns and add up their goods and charge them taxes. He was an accountant, was what he was. And so what Matthew does is he organizes all of Jesus' teaching into columns and so i'm i'm not exactly sure that jesus actually said five six and seven exactly all in one place because what we find is every part of this uh sermon on the mount luke puts it in a whole different location i I think matthew collected stuff kind of like you know our collections and he put it in a book and that's how the holy spirit wanted to put it in matthew's gospel so what's amazing is this is actually probably five six and seven a compilation kind of like 
the content of, of most all of Jesus' sermons. And he put them all together. And look what he says in chapter 6 and verse 19. He just gets done with how to pray. And that's 6 uh, from 5 down to 15. But then he gets in verse 19 into really uh, uh, meddling, uh, these people would have thought. And this is what he says, verse 19, Don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. And I've told you many times, lay up means stack. The, the Greek word means to pile. It means to, literally means, do not lay one upon another, upon another, upon another. And, and I do know, I've told you the story, when I first started out in New England in ministry, uh, one of the new visitors invited us to see their house, and they, they just finished building it, and they said, we want you to see it. And they took us in, actually, to their closet, which, in the parsonage we were living, was larger than our entire bedroom. Their closet, it was a drive-in closet. It wasn't a walk-in, it was a drive-in <laughs> And uh, the man says, look, he says, I have the latest kind of closet. And I had never seen, he literally had 50 sweaters. And each one was, uh, you know how you send them to the cleaners and they clean them and wrap them up and put them in plastic. And, and he had written on the end, you know, college football sweater. And I mean, he, and they were just like this. And it was 50 sweaters. I was very impressed. Then he had 50 shirts. He had about 30 pairs of shoes. And you know what? I thought of Matthew six nineteen. Don't stack treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But stack, he uses the same word, so that we understand it. Stack up your treasures in heaven, because moth and rust won't get it there, and thieves can never break in and steal. But here's the big reason. For where your treasure is, your heart will be. And there comes the, 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 how we're going to go through life. If my treasures are that piano... And they're on earth. And every day I get older, I'm getting further away, and I'm dreading the fact that I am going to have to leave my treasures. But if I have taken my treasures and I have sent them ahead, then the older I get, my arms get wider because I'm getting closer to my treasures. And death is not dreadful. That's why Paul says, uh, when I die, it's my hope and joy and crown of rejoicing because I'm going to see what I live for. I'm going to see my treasures. And that's what Jesus is giving through here. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It will be your orientation. It will be whether or not death is dreadful or, or delightful because it, death is a, a taking down of the tent, a rolling up of the temporary. Uh, it's, it's leaving behind that which is, is falling apart and frail and fragile and temporal and leaving it behind for what is better, far better. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate now. Look at verse 24. He says, you can't serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and your money. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life. This is how you change, he says. See, he's reasoning with them about what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Isn't life more than food and body? He says, come on, don't think just about the temporal. Think about the eternal. Uh, Isn't life more than food, the body more than clothing? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. And on and on it goes. Turn real quickly to Luke 12. And that's where we're going to end this morning. Where we began, actually, when I read this for the prayer. Luke 12, 13. And I want you to think of these verses the second time through. And these should be yellowed and starred and highlighted and um, marked and noted in your Bible. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, my brother, tell him to divide the inheritance with me. That's a temporal life thing. I want my share. I want my antique. I want my ownership of the property. I want the money. I want the stock, whatever. Tell him to divide it with me. But he said to him, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? He says, I'm not into this temporal stuff. I'm not going to spend my time haggling over that. Jesus, I mean, you can just see him. Verse 15, take heed. He says, watch out. Beware of the cancer of covetousness. For life does not consist. Real life isn't measured by the abundance. It is in America. It is in Western Europe. It is in the 
burgeoning Far East. It is more and more around our world, but it's not in God's book. But in, in the temporal life, it is by how much you possess. But with God, it's not. So, so life doesn't consist in how much you possess. And you know what? If some of you want to get out of depression, why don't you take that to heart? You will never catch up with some people in this world and in this church. So why don't you not want to? Why compete? Why not just stop and just say, I, my, I'm going to earn as much as I can to live on as least as possible so I can give as much as I can to the Lord, not to the church. It's not a capital campaign for the earth. This is a reorientation of life for the Lord. You know, I heard someone say, I don't think they realized I was listening, but I heard him say, oh, man, you know, when those, those missionary teams start going, I get about 40 letters. I thought, you get 40 opportunities to share and to be rich in giving? I admire you. I envy you. I don't get 40 letters. Isn't that how we look on it? Like, oh, I get it. I get it. Everybody's asking for my money. No, God has given you more opportunities to be rich. But if you're looking at your treasure on earth, it's people trying to hack away at it. And, and you're going to guard it. And you're not going to give that away. You're going to protect it. And the older you get, you're going to dread having to give it up because you've saved and focused on it. And God is giving you 40 opportunities to send it ahead and to look forward. It's amazing the different orientation he asks. Okay. So he says, Take heed, beware of covetous. Now, verse 16, here's the parable. The ground of this certain rich man uh, was very profitable and it yielded plentifully. In other words, he had a good job, wise investments. The guy, I mean, everything, he, he, could, he could spot a deal, he could buy and sell. He was really good. Verse 17, so he thought within himself, big problem. He left God out. He just he had a little counsel with himself. He thought within himself, hmm, what am I going to do with this? He didn't say, God, oh, what am I going to do with all this? I don't, I don't want to be trapped and ensnared by it. What should I do with it? No, he said, hmm, what I thought within myself. What should I do since I have no room to store my crops? What he should have said is, I'm going to give them away. Do you know what the cure is to affluenza? Giving. you know what the cure is to materialism? Giving. Hilarious. That's the Greek word, hilarion. Excited and joyful giving. It's the giving of a poor person who has nothing, but if they can give their last $20 bill away to some uh, person in need, they, they, they thrill to give it. Okay, verse uh, 18. This is the American dream. This is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater ones. I'm going to increase my ability to make money and store it. And there's nothing wrong with the making. There's a big problem with the storing. He left God out of his plans, and I'll store my crops and my goods. And now he left God out of his future. He said, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Sounds like uh, one of these people who can retire, you know, young and, and play golf or travel in their boat the rest of their life. Got many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. That's the retirement mantra. Eat healthily, drink moderately, and be merry, okay? But God said to him, fool, that should put a shiver through your retirement plans if you've left God out of them. If your retirement plans are all financial when you're 20 and 30 and 40 and 50, fool, God says, tonight your soul is going to be required of you. Then who will those things be whom you have provided? You know, we can't hold on to them. They're not ours. We just use them during life. Even when we die, we can't hold on to them because the government will take them and, and the lawyers will take them and, and time will take them and upheaval financially will take them. You can't keep them. Whose are they going to be? That's a good question to ask. Verse 21. He left God out of his dreams. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and isn't rich toward God. Vitality in our eternal life means we're alive and thinking and motivated by the fact that we are already immortal. We're thinking eternally when we start seeing what our moments look like as they're observed from God's throne. And all of a sudden we see that our lifespan and our resources were all given us by another who owns us and wants a return on his investment. We need to pray for vitality in the eternal life of our children. 
but more than that, in the eternal life of their parents and grandparents.